Okay, I'm going for this. Um, well, good evening. Um, tonight, I am joined by advertising and commercial photographer Mark Williamson. Mark lives just outside of Nutsford in Cheshire with his wife, two children, and a whole menagerie of animals. He's 47. He's been shooting advertising and commercial the longest of all of the disciplines. And he trained under the renowned, 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 the renowned fashion and advertising photographer Moy Williams in Manchester. He's shot for numerous people, numerous brands such as um, such as Reebok, uh, Umbro, JCB, Bruntwood, Magnet, uh, quite a lot of work with Sales Sharks, uh, and also Ping as well, which is a well-known international brand along with quite a few of the others. So. Mark, welcome, and it's nice to have you here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, okay, we're just gonna. I'm gonna get straight into the thing. So we, we've known each other for quite a few years, um, but I've got some questions here that I didn't know that I actually want answering, and I think we may as well share these uh, with with the rest of uh, civilization, uh, and we'll see who's uh, who wants to wants to respond. So. <clears throat> Where did it all begin? What what got you looking at photography as as a career? Um, my dad he's pretty much retired now, but he was a motorsport photographer. So um, my mum was an art teacher. My dad was a photographer, and it just was sort of the natural direction. I messed around at college, tried illustration for a bit, but photography was the direction I wanted to go in. Um, so ever since, you know, I was in education, I knew I wanted to be a photographer and I sort of quite quickly came to the conclusion that if you're going to spend most of your waking life at work, enjoy your work. Um, so I then went to Mid Cheshire College after my uh, foundation course. <clears throat> and that's where I got a, a work placement with Moy Williams, who, um, who despite his... Uh, his many years is still shooting great work today. Um, but Moy was, you know, a great opportunity and we did loads of good stuff and it was just a really good. It could have sort of been ahead for me. Well, it's interesting. I've you know, I've never, I've never personally uh, worked with any specific agencies or any specific photographers, but it's, it's interesting to hear that. Um, so from there, when did you get your first break and did you know when it was, was it, uh, that's it, that's the moment, this is it. Um, or was it, or, or how did it, how did it, how did you know you were, you were actually in it to win it after Mid Cheshire? I mean, at the time there was, it was quite a sort of regimented path that every photographer an aspiring photographer in in the area that I wanted to work in would take. So you would go and assist a photographer full time, and then you'd become a freelance assistant. So you you cut your teeth in a full time studio. You would learn how one man, woman, person company operates, and you really you see everything. Then you go freelance as an assistant, and that's when you work with other photographers. You see different styles, different uh, techniques, different kits, different locations, different ways of handling clients. Um, and then you become a photographer. I was lucky. I did the, I did, I think four years or more, then I went freelance for a couple of years and then he just kept booking me. So, you know, there was obviously a shortage of freelance assistants around at the time. So I spent a lot of time back at the studio and, and then I, I was fortunate to be given that break to become a second shooter for him, which is not the sort of break that many assistants get. And that made that transition. Um, and then there just came a point, I remember one day saying to him, look, I think I've got to go. You know, it was a great place to work and it was really hard to leave. But there just comes a time when you go, I don't want to be an assistant. I want to be a photographer. So that was the moment. And I had a handful of my own clients, which I think is the biggest hurdle. I've got a, a couple of guys who've assisted me over the last two years. And I just keep saying to them, the hard thing is making that break from assistant to photographer because all of a sudden you've got, you had one client or a handful of clients. Now you've got, you know, zero clients. So it's that leap was really hard. So it was sort of done for me to a certain degree. So it's it's interesting. I think a lot of people want to be photographers who don't who 
some of them know the route in and some of them just are trying to find their way. And I think that recognizing that you've got to do it, you can't just leap and have absolutely no clients. You've got to, there's like a steady migration. I think that's, I think it's good advice actually for anyone wanting to try and, you know, to, to break into it and to, to actually, to make it work. I mean, there's a lot of photographers, but you know, everyone has a style, but I think that having clients before you make the leap commercially is definitely the right, you know, it is definitely the right decision. Um, so when did, did, did clients start to approach you or was it more agency led or how does, how did, how did you, you know, how did you start to hoover up clients once you'd, once you'd left? Well, I've been in the industry for probably six years, seven years. So I had those introductions. I have clients now that left, you know, that when I left Moyes, we share clients. So he would, he would, you know, they would always go in for the bigger jobs and there was something that was, you know, quite a small job and, you know, below his day rate, then, you know, often I got looked, you know, I got first dibs on that. Um, so that got the ball rolling and then through word of mouth, you meet other clients and, and people migrate from different agencies. So I could work with a, an art director from one agency and then two, three years later, they move and set up their own agency or move to a different agency and same with, um, account handlers and whoever in the industry and that way you're, your network grows slowly, but then you, you pick up your own clients through pure word of mouth. I've got, um, I'd say probably 70, maybe 60% of my work comes through advertising, design, marketing agencies. Um, but the rest is clients direct and some are just headshots at an office or some are landscapes, you know, for artwork, you know, for walls. So it's all sort of varied and different, but your clients build is your career builds. No, it's it. I think the, I think one thing that for for creatives and, and certainly for freelancers, is it's maintaining your, um, you know, it's it's actually it's it's maintaining what you're doing. Doing the job, who and then going out getting more clients. I think they've that they, they have been, they're the hardest parts. I think. Um, in photography, and any, in fact, any 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 creative industry or any industry whatsoever, but I think creative, we're the most, without sounding horrible, we're the most droppable. You know, we, we can be replaced quite quickly, um, and it's always down to cost. It's never actually down to anything else. So maintaining and keeping and hoovering clients up is is critical, and as you said, it, it's it's having you know it's. It's relationship developed. It's a relationship built. The fact that you've got you can cross over and still connect up with clients, I think that's, uh, or at least connect it with agencies and share works. I think mm. that's that's well worth doing because that's being less precious. That's actually sharing a, a pool because ultimately you can you combine yourselves to compete. You don't, you know, you're not sort of disappearing off to compete. You're combining to compete, which is which I think is a a better way for. It is a better way, unless, of course, you want to be like uh, fine art photography or <coughs> high-end portrait, which is actually uncompetable because it's a specialist. It's highly specialist and highly stylized. Um, so I did promise you that I wouldn't talk about the subject, but I'm going to have to because you've just you've sowed the seed with what you just said, literally sowed the seed. Um, so during the current crisis how have you what what's what's happening talk talk to me about work how things are going and and what's going on you don't have to unload the whole thing but just just talk me through how you've been coping with it um it shouldn't take too long there's not much to talk about but <laughs> as as it unfolded and i think it was the same for all of us it was it was all a bit oh you know coronavirus and it was a bit of a joke and then you know then it got a bit serious and all of a sudden, we realised that you know the sort of the severity of it, and th this is going to be life impacting for the world globally, you know. And as a business owner, I just saw those shoots that were booked in frozen, postponed, and now it's you, you don't know when. I mean, everything just drops off a cliff within about a week, two weeks. Um, so I. The way I run my business, 
I don't qualify for any government support. So uh, my wife earns uh, a small amount. She gets a little, little bit of support. I've had, I mean, t- a couple of tiny jobs that are, you know, really, you know, not normally worth doing, but I've sort of grabbed at everything. But um, I've been, the last two weeks, I've been working for a friend's landscaping company, which is great because I love gardening. But it's, you've, you've got, you know, I've got kids and, as you've said, a menagerie of animals to feed. And um, you've got to bring an income in somewhere. But um, I get it's the same for all of us. It's, you know, a, a lot of my clients work in areas that are, you know, could be hospitality or could be, uh, I don't know, catering or events or whatever. And it's all that stuff is just kiboshed for the foreseeable future. So I I don't know when I'm going to start shooting. We do, I do, you know, mainly commercial stuff, but we also have a, a children's uh, photography brand that might start picking up towards the end of the summer, some of the pop-up shoots, but I have no idea when it's going to start. So as from tomorrow, I'm back on the lawnmower. Yeah, it's, uh, well, likewise, and I'm sure there are many like us who are, who run, you run your business, you run your operation um, in a specific way, um, and you don't qualify. I don't qualify either, but I've... I've managed to maintain some work, so I've, I, it's working for me. But to knowing that there are so many people out there, so many creatives with capabilities, incredible capabilities, and you can't do anything about it. I've, I do can't. I am concerned hugely about people's mental well-being um, and how they how they how they're coping with it. And that's why I've always asked the question. In fact, I've been reaching out to more people since we've been in this situation because not out of guilt because I've got some, you know, I've got paid work coming in, but it's not as much as it was. That's for sure. That, mm. that is, that's for definite. I've lost loads of contracts. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my clients has gone into administration. I've got another one that's killed off there. So, so I get it. So listening to, listening to, to you, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're, you're going back onto a, you know, a manual job. Um, so yeah, that's, it's, it's interesting. I think before I progress, I've got someone who wants to ask a question, although they've just messaged me now, so I'm just going to ask him. Fire away. Sorry, watchers. I know it's a little bit sort of indiscreet. Um, so, okay, so I'll, I'll move away from that because I can say I've, I've already started to, like, melt the situation down here. So let's bring this back up. Would you, would you uh, bring it back up with, could you tell me your worst photographic moment when when name talk me through the, this this moment and, and and describe how it won't happen again <laughs> i mean that's how you, you learn your lessons and i say this to everyone who's assisting me it's like you've got to make mistakes it's the it's like falling off the bike isn't it you've got to make mistakes and i've made plenty um one of the early days and this obviously shows how old i am but when i was assisting i'm I going to <clears throat> I think I did this a couple of times, actually. I went to shoot and totally forgot to take the film. <laughs> got away with it. Got away with it. You know, they were close to the studio. We could send couriers. But, oh, you know, and I'd forget bits of kit, you know, like lights and or stands or little, just a little, tiny bit. You know, if you had, at the time, we all had sync leads and now they're all, you know, radio sync. But if you didn't have that sync lead, nothing worked. None of your lights worked. You know, that your camera couldn't talk to the lights, all this stuff. So there were countless, countless moments like that. But I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, I've learned to, um, I've almost had some disasters on hard drives. So you learn to double back up everything on hard drives. You you just learn by mistakes. Um, I don't think I've put my foot in it too dramatically. I've not said the wrong thing or been inappropriate or, you know, I've, I'm very... I'm very sort of very cautious. I'm a man of the people, I like to think. So, yeah, I think I've sort of got away with most things without any major catastrophes. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, I don't think I've had any, well, not that I can think of without upsetting clients that are probably watching. Um, okay, so on the flip side of that, what has been, what has been one of your best photographic moments, mainly for the style, the capture, the look, the when you when you because you know when you push the shutter and it, you're looking at the camera. Well, I mean, back then there was no looking at the camera, but if it was a Polaroid, you knew where it was headed. Um, but if it was if if you're looking at it now, 
what would be one of your favorite photographic moments? I don't know. That's a tough one. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I probably, I really enjoyed the uh, Tatton Park project that I did. And I've still, to this day, not done a proper edit. You know, there's like two years worth of work and 40,000 photos that I was hoping to properly edit during lockdown, but the weather's been so good, I can't, can't get out of the garden. Um, but there was one day when I was doing that project and, you know, Tatton gave me access, you know, I've been sort of vetted. I knew the, I knew all the staff there. Um, so I was in the park early doors, it was March and it was a really foggy morning. I mean, you couldn't see more than like 30 foot in front of you. And no, actually, no, sorry. It was, it was, um, yeah, it was, um, it was in October. It was during the rut. So you could hear the stags calling, but you couldn't see them. And then all of a sudden their silhouettes would creep up on you. And, you know, at the same time, obviously your silhouette would creep up, creep up on them. So you get this sort of these moments and it was like what I would imagine to be a primeval scene, just these silhouettes of these beautiful creatures with the other stags calling in the dark. Um, yeah, I think that was just one of those, one of those days. If I'm going to pick a day, that was one of those days where I just wandered around. And I, as far as there was no one else in the park, as far as I was aware, you couldn't see anyone anyway. But uh, yeah, I loved it. Loved it. I've no, I don't think I've ever actually been in in that sort of lone situation before like that. That's that's quite it's quite a nice romantic pr uh, picture. I was getting quite lost in that that dreamlike film. Well, I'm thinking about how I'd film that. You know, um, no, it's it's that's good. So. I think that, um, all right, okay, we have a question. We're going to do it. I work, we are going to do a few other things. Actually, so should we have a look at your uh, the slideshow first and go through some of the shots? Sure. I think I think that's probably one of the best. I think we should do that at least now because that way I can, you know, I can actually look at, we can talk through some of these, uh, some of these shots because one or two of the shots, I think, do, do appear in here. So yeah, there's Tatton ones, well, yeah. Yeah, so we've got the first one up is the is a, a fantastic um, portrait with the with tat with the uh, uh, with a with a deer. Um, it's a it is a silhouette shot, and it's uh, I think it's a, absolutely it's a killer killer picture. How how did that how did that bit present itself? How did you pre how did that how was that a capture? And what uh, what did you do? That was that morning. That was the first, that was one of the first shots that, you know, I took that day. I, I came in the Rosslyn entrance and um, just you drive slowly, it's foggy so you can't see anything. And I just saw the silhouette of a stack. So I got out of the car, first shot, you know, probably I probably took half a dozen before that actual composition. Um, but that image is probably the image. What I want to do is when I finally edit this project, so I want to do a book because all my work is so short-lived for marketing purposes i want to have something that has a life that will maybe sit on the old copy table um and that will be the front cover image i love it that just to me just says regal majestic relax natural tatten i love it love it yeah i remember i remember seeing some of the shots appearing on facebook um and it, there were actually because i've i've not i'm not a wildlife photographer in fact I've, I've never really done wildlife or anything like that in fact the longest zoom i've had in my hand is probably about a, uh about 200 mil um and so it's for me it's i'm just i don't i don't see it in fact landscapes and wildlife that i've never got a thrill for them however since lockdown i've developed quite an interesting affinity to the world around me because i'm i've got a little bit more time around and i'm looking around mm. um but I just I do like that. I think it's I think it is actually quite an iconic looking picture, um, and it is it is lovely. I'm going to move on now to uh, the Moscow State Circus. Was t did you was this when it visited? Uh, uh, obviously UK, but did you do a, a deeper study with these guys, or was this was this just a chance moment? Yeah, this was part of the Tatum project, but it became its own project. Um, the circus was, you know, comprised of a load of, you know, they're all Russian um, gymnasts, and, gymnasts and athletes. Um, but it turns out the guy who runs it came from Nutsford. And, yeah, 
And he basically, uh, I think he, the story he told me is one day he had an argument with the teacher and said, right, I'm going to run off and join the circus. And he did. And now he runs the Moscow State Circus. <laughs> it's quite a classic <laughs> then, thing, though. So they used to come to Tatton every two or three years. I don't know if they still do, but I spoke to them beforehand. You have to with anything like this. You've got to get permission to go in. You've got to get um, consent forms, uh, model release forms of everyone you photograph. So he would do that. He'd blanket sign this form for the whole, you know, um, members, all the members of his cast. And I spent two days in there just doing portraits and documenting behind the scenes, you know, the actual show. Uh, and it was amazing. I mean, just great to watch, but just wonderful theatre because it's, you know, I think that shot was just outside between acts. So he was just having a cigarette against the truck and I just saw it compose itself. But when you go inside, they're all lit up by all the sort of the, the theatre lights. So there's some great stuff. Loved it. That was another great project. So that's a sort of, it almost feels like a little sneaky, uh, quite a privileged peek behind the scenes at, uh, at how the whole facade of the circus life is. It's interesting. I do like that. Um, so I have another one here. This is, um, I think this is a child. Is it, I'm guessing it, this is one of your children? Just walking, yeah. it's literally walking, or is this just a random shot? I can't see these, so you're, you're going to have okay. to talk through. They <laughs> okay, well, right, okay. It's... Uh, uh, and, and, and I know the shot you mean. This was when I was in Southeast Asia, and I went there backpacking probably about 15 years ago, just over 15 years ago. And it was at that point where I thought all my friends had done it. I'd done lots of traveling as an assistant, which was great, and I'd seen, you know, tons of countries, beautiful countries on great shoots. But I'd never gone backpacking. I never had that adventure. And I thought, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. You know, I'll settle down, I'll have a family, which I have done, it's great. But that's that was my last opportunity to go with a camera and just go traveling. And I did four months around Southeast Asia, which is, you know, well-traveled. You know, it's quite a popular back backpacker destination, but that was in, uh, I think that was in Laos. And it was just, I think it was a child walking through a field. There must've been burning crops or something. So it's got that, you know, some people think it could be a waterfall in the background or, you know, you don't know what the scene is, but I quite like that ambiguous nature to any image. You know, you can interpret what you what you see from every, you know, any any piece of creativity. Um, but, yeah, that was an adventure. I loved it. So I hope uh, that was actually one of the questions from uh, from Sebastian. Asked Mark about his photography trip to Asia. So. That was obviously obviously quite an influential thing for you. Is there anything you learnt there? Maybe maybe about a skill or people, or is there anything that you've that challenged the way you thought when you went uh, when you did that? First thing I learnt, which was quite a quick lesson, was to keep your eye on your cameras and don't drink too much. So first night, Koh San Road in Bangkok, and my life, my wallet my passport, everything. Because I'm staying in, I gave myself a budget of five pounds a day. So it's like cheap guest houses and, um, you know, very cheap hotel rooms and my cameras all in one bag. I go and meet a load of people, get drunk. We sat out, on the, you know, on the on the street, it's dark. I walk off and leave my camera bag around the street. And then five minutes later, freak out, realize I've not got my bag and go back and still there. So that was the first thing I learned. Um, but yeah, I just, the aim for me was to document the life of a backpacker. You know, it was, everyone did it at that time. Loads of my friends had done it. And it was just to go and enjoy and meet people. I, I gave myself sort of brief to, um, there were some places I wanted to go, but be free, be open and go with it. So you'd find yourself hopping in the back of a pickup. I mean, I would end up going to a refugee camp on the, uh, uh, me and my border with some French guy that I met who, you know, I'd only known him about a week. And then we did this crazy trek in there with a, with a pastor to take them clothes. I had to, you know, be careful what cameras I used because it was watched by the military. So I just ended up going on these amazing adventures and just went with it. Looking at 
a silhouette. It looks like a wedding couple somewhere. It's an absolutely fantastic. I love the fact. I just. I think this is a, this is a cracking shot. Um, the, I'm guessing it's a bride and groom. I'm also guessing it may well be Scotland. It's quite high up somewhere. Certainly, there's a mountainscape there. Um, where was that? Where was that shot? That was Loch Lomond, and that was last year. Um, as you know, I did weddings, uh, I shot weddings for about 10 years, and I still do a few. Um, I don't sort of market it anymore because, you know, I want to spend time with the kids now at the weekend. Um, I do the odd one for friends, family. That was for Charlene and Phil, who Charlene works at Tatton. I knew her through Kristen and all the other, all the other team in the events um, department at Tatton. She's from Lot Lomond. Uh, so we all went up for the weekend. Beautiful, beautiful place. I mean, the views where you can see amazing. Um, it was, I can't remember what month of the year it was, but it absolutely threw it down. But it, at the same time, it rained more here back in England than it did there in Scotland. So, you know, that was that point in the night where the rain had stopped and you had that low level mist just sitting on the lake. And I think we'd been to a castle and then we're walking back to the marquee and I just saw this composition through the trees and say, guys, get up there, just talk, kiss. And that was it. It was just, that's, and I like the, the shot because it's a bit of a sort of traditional silhouette couple shot, but it was, it, you know, there, I always say to, you know, anyone who's getting married, look, make sure you can get a photographer and get something when it rains and you've got to react. And that was, you see the moment you grab the couple, go and do something. And I love it. I love mountains. I love Scotland. Um, so it was a nice, I mean, I've done so many weddings. I've got so many shots I love, but that just to me is one of those nice wedding shots that I've taken. It is a, it is a strong image that, and I think it's, a, it's almost mono. It, I mean, is it monoc It looks monochromatic that, um, but it is, it's it colour. Is... It's it's pro. It's quite late in the day, so you know the sun's. There was never any sun that day, but uh, there's not much colour <laughs> knocking around. Um, yeah, so there's. It's it looks monochromatic, but there is. It is shot in colour. Yeah. Oh, it's lovely. I think. I don't know. I don't know which one I've sent you. Um, yeah, I, t I, c I can see there's a tint in there, but it's uh, this uh, this. But it's almost monochrome. Um, your now this is. <sighs> I'm, I'm intrigued because I can see. This is a sports a sports uh, sports where it's a building site, and there's a, there's a couple of flashes here. I think it's, it's probably three flashes, and maybe maybe two flashes and a, uh, and some bounce in the, in in the shot. I'm not wanting to get too techy for people who don't don't quite understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but just work me through this one because it's raining and you've got gear out in the rain, and it's not an easy capture that. But it's nice and industrial because he pops straight out of that frame. Just talk, walk me through the shot. Um, yeah, JCB. I've shot for JCB for probably five or six years. Great client. I mean, just the shoots we did. Um, again, through a friend of mine who's got an agency. And uh, we did loads of, loads of great stuff. This was probably one of the last shoots we did, actually. It was on a building site in Nutsford. Um uh, one of Tim Hatton's sites, um, and he let us go in there, so we had to do you know the various health and safety checks. And this site was not being used at the time, so we had to use building sites that were uh, there was no one working on it. So we had to you know we had access to those places, and we could see this big storm cloud coming in. And you know, nine times out of ten, we're trying to set up these shots to look like heavy rain. It never looks right, but we were using. Um, battery powered uh, lighting pro photo kit that I'd hired from uh, what is now Wex. Covered everything in like clear plastic bags, got outside and I think it was probably two heads. Um, but even then you don't get the magnitude of the rain with that. You can see it, you can see that it's raining and that sky is as that sky was, but yeah, it was hammering it down. Would you be tempted to comp in any uh, extra rain splatter there? To just to emphasize it, or would would you leave it on a trail? 
I wouldn't. I get a really good retoucher to do it. Um, <laughs> but I, I wouldn't do it. Like a child, how to go. But yeah, well, we, we did. Funny enough, when the first JCB shoots I did, they did that, and it, I don't think it was raining. I don't think it was raining. But yeah, we we did all that. So, I mean, it's, you can do anything these days, can't you? Yeah, that's that is mm, that is the problem. I hate that impress when shots are manipulated. It's okay in advertising marketing because that's part of it. You know, mm. you're, you're trying to get the best image, the best product, the best view, the best look. But in media, I find it intolerable that people do get away with sending shots to the media that have been tweaked. And uh, yeah. Anyway, so moving on, um, there is this. It is so I, I like this because it's so polished. Um, and I'm guessing it's it's live. It's on the street. Um, but with the, the couple sat there having coffee. Uh, it's it's such a nice shot it pops who was this for by the way this was a shoot uh, i think was it last year year before last for ers so it's an equity release supermarket and it was totally staged uh models both uh north of england models at a cafe in Manchester. So this is a, sort of one of those classic location advertising shoots that we do. We get, you've got a recce location, do your casting for your models, you've got to produce it, clients giving you a brief. I wanted to have that sort of feel. So it was, you know, early autumn, could be generic European city. Um, and that's why we went with that, that location. So it's not obviously Manchester, could be anywhere. So what you can't see are the big ARRI lights the big HD, HDMI lights, um, HMI lights, sorry, um, pumping a bit of sunshine in through there. Um, yeah, great shoot, loved it. It's got yeah. it's got atmosphere. It has. There's there's a lovely vibe and a lovely warmth. So it was. Uh, it just it just it's it's a great shot. I, I mean, I know it's an advertising shot straight away. I mean, anybody can can pick it out, but it is a it's a nice uh, it's a nice shot. It's a nice shot. Um, we've got quite a few. Um, questions coming in now which is quite nice so we have now I, t I didn't know too much about your mountain work or how much you enjoy climbing uh, or at least at least shooting in in that environment so this shot is the, the clouds are rolling in but it looks like there's heavier clouds coming in as well and you can see trails where people have walked through this thing but it looks like that's you can get a feeling for it you know those that trail is gonna is is likely to close down at, at any point because the weather is just gonna lock it out. So, where were where was this shot? Was this Scotland again? Was this Wales? Where, where was the shot? And just talk me through what happened next in this scene. Uh, that was Pyrenees last <coughs> last year, last March. Um, I go away probably for the last seven years. We've been doing little mountain trips, and I got into it with a friend. It was his 40th. We went, did our first trip to uh, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And then since then, we go to Scotland, Wales and a few other places. But this was Pyrenees. It was on the way back down. And it was one of those days where there was some heavy weather coming in. It looks worse. The weather looks worse than it, it was. But when you're up there, the weather changes so quickly. It can be baking hot, especially in March, one minute. And then, you know, like minus 15 and hurricane winds like 20 minutes later. So... Um, yeah, it was just one of those moments where every time you go, the landscape changes second by second. And so I don't think there was any need for people. I did a, sh a few where there were some people in, in the frame, but actually you can see the footprint so you can get a s sense of scale just in yeah. that. It's quite yeah. nice just to see, see that landscape, you know, without someone in it. I think that it's just the, just the suggestion that there were human beings there. Excuse me. <clears throat> the suggestion that we're human beings there is the nice element, is the thing that reconnects you as a as a as a as a viewer or as someone who's actually looking at that shot into mm. what it's about and and where it is. But I I didn't know that was France. But it's uh, it is I I think it is a it's a deeply atmospheric shot and it does look like a huge sort of snowstorm is about to is about to s smash into the landscape there, which is good. Oh, it's good. It's a lovely atmospheric shot. Um, the leaping shot. We're leaping oh, yeah. across. It's so it's deliciously framed. It's a heavy vignette on that, but there's a it, it's so it's not because the the sky, the actual sky itself, the clouds 
a multi-textural. You've got lots of different types of clouds going on there. And and you've got either a, a snowfall that's and the grass is just 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 creeping through it. Um where was that where was that one taken? That was Snowden. Um a few years ago. It was just one of those days, one of those weekends. I think we would we go away and this friend of mine, Matt, he's an outdoor leader. So he normally takes he leads these trips because um I've done a bit, but I'm by no means qualified to do anything, you know, too crazy. So um, I'm always a guy slowing everyone down, taking photos when they want to be cracking on and getting up the mountain and getting back down to the <laughs> cabin or wherever we're staying. Uh, this was just one of those moments, and that is uh, another friend of mine, Ben, who's in the shot, and he actually suggested sort of, you know, I said that I saw this this composition, then he said, well, how about if I just jump over there? What do you think? And, and so it was a sort of set up moment. It wasn't as much as it looks like a real action moment in time it's totally staged but you know smoke and mirrors <laughs> but that's wrong with a few smoke and mirrors we, we do a load of stuff in snowden and it's great i mean i'm i love when you're up there the knowledge that not a lot of people go up there and we go up there in winter it's always winter when we go sort of climbing the mountains because it just gives you a slightly more sense of adventure i think the last trip we did was in scotland in February this year, and I forgot what the storm was that we had at the time, but I mean, we were, you were leaning like 45 degrees into the wind just to stay on your feet. <laughs> right, you know, it's... It gets you on edge, because you've, you've also, if you're out there doing that, you're, you're limited on how long you can be, because if the weather's changing, mm. uh, when it comes down to setting up for shots, it's not, I'm assuming it's not that feasible, especially up there in the middle of, in the, middle of the mountains. No, you, you you tend to react. So you'll I'll go up there with no specific brief in mind. Occasionally, you know, we did shoot for spray way a few years ago, and that was just free range, just go up and shoot some stuff. Um, so I've not had to do much in the way of uh, specific production while you're up in the mountain. A lot of it is ad hoc. You've got to get a good shot of this garment or that moment and tell some sort of story, but. You know, I'm getting to know my way around uh, the lakes and uh, Snowdonia quite well now. So I'm starting to know nice ridges, nice angles. But it, like you know, like I said, it changes. The weather changes minute by minute. And, you know, you go wait, waiting for this big, beautiful cloud moment or an inverse. And you don't get it. And then you come back down and then you see the weather happening. But, you know, if you stayed up there for half an hour later, you, you got it. But That's, That is the nature of that kind of photography mm. but although it may be slightly staged the, the actual none of the other elements would be in place uh half an hour after that so it is momentary it really is um the harry potter shot um <laughs> <laughs> is this in your studio at home or is this just in the st how is this because there's a couple of light sources here um how did that how did that evolve and how's that how's that taken this yeah, this is one of the last shots we did in the studio. We um, we had the studio in a an old stable across the the yard from our house. That's now being you know a builder's developing into into some houses. So I thought to finish our uh, the studio's career, as it were, I want to do a couple of shots of the kids. So um, that's Bertie. He's four. Um, my daughter Tabitha is eight, and they wanted to be. They love Harry Potter at the moment. So. Tab dressed up as Hermione and Bert obviously had to be Harry. Uh, so we did a little uh, scar. He's got all that kit anyway. He runs around shouting Expecto Patronum everywhere he goes. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to just play around with a bit of lighting and just do something slightly atmospheric. It wasn't a huge, huge shot to do. It took us probably about a day on and off just messing, messing around with lights, just jumping on it testing doing other things then go back and playing around but yeah i mean it's i do a lot of stuff photographing children it's a lot harder to photograph your own children than anyone else's because your children never listen to you there were about three shots that i got of him and that was the best one yeah well i can i can concur i think that the photo the main photos where there was pose when there was no posing and it was more natural sort of ended about five years ago uh, and then there's like now a layers of 
of self-consciousness. No, I need to look like, I don't like that. What's happening? No, delete that. I don't like this. So actually, I got to the point where I've, you know, I started uh, with, with a raft of a server's worth of photos uh, down to maybe, I don't know, just a little flash drive with some shots on I've taken over the past five years because there's less, there's less engagement. So I get, I get that, actually. Yeah, it's almost like you need to someone else to photograph your kids. Actually, Mark, I may ask you to come and photograph the kids. <laughs> Just give it a couple of months when, when we can then uh, be less socially distant. Yeah, yeah. Well, also, I've got... You Whenever know, that I, is. I do have a studio. You can always use that if you need any studio time. Anyway, that's something we'll discuss offline. Um, so, right, Harry Potter's great. I love Harry Potter. Um, and then we have uh, an absolute cracking sandwich-eating shot. And that hat... That hat just it, it it literally bursts out of that um, uh, out of that shot, and it sets the tone for personality of uh, of child as well. With that, I think it's it's quite it's quite cool. Just just where where was this one taken? That was on holiday in Anglesey. I think we'd gone down for uh, where did we go to? Um, Bo Morris, and it was either New Year's Eve. It was winter sometime. And um, we go there, you know, between there and the lakes, love both places. And I thought, I can't put a shot of Bertie in the slideshow and not have one of Tabs. But that is one of those shots I love of Tabitha and Kristen, just a total genuine moment. And it's that's the thing I love about photography. And that was, you know, I don't want to go on too much about it, but one of the, some, some of my inspirational photographers when I started at college were journalistic documentary photographers and that's the style that I really love so this is just I, whenever I go anywhere you know I've always got a camera um, sometimes it's just a phone but on holidays half the time I'm probably going to have a proper you know SLR camera knocking around and that was just one of those real engaged moments yeah I, I, I do like that I think I think the fact that the biggest fear was that, that phones were going to take over from the professionalism from from this now in the world of, of where i am which is press and press documentary that's happened that's that's absolutely happened you know i'm i'm uh i i see regular phone pictures being used in media i have used phone shots in media because you've got to capture the shot mm. but to have um uh to, to keep cameras with you all the time as you know they're bulky bloody things they're 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 heavy and you know, you know, I'm never really satisfied with just having the three lenses with me. No, just having the one lens. It's, uh, you know, you think, well, I, I may need a zoom if I take a zoom. Do you want to, actually, I'll just take one prime and and one one telly, and yeah. But that 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 image is is definitely you, you know you can't you couldn't get that on a phone. It's not even feasible. No, that's like a seventy two hundred. You know, you've got to have a telephoto lens and. You know what it's like. You always you see something and go, oh, I need to be on this lens or, you know, I need maybe with this or if I got there half an hour. It's always, the, as a, f a photographer, you're always frustrated with your results because you're never happy with it. But <laughs> you could have just polished it a little bit better, couldn't you? I was having a, uh, I was having a, a socially distanced coffee with my neighbor, John McDonald Smith, who I would, I'm going to name check because why not? Um, and he is, uh, we were talking about, sharpening and 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 how how difficult it is and and actually how um how you by by practice and by change you you constantly reassess the job you've just done in order to get better at it in the future and i think that i am just exactly as you've said it is it's i think it's a thing for photographers uh, certainly mm -hmm. it's a progressive thing you've you've constantly looking I could have done that. I should have changed the aperture, or that's just a bit soft. Or even though I've taken, you know, like even though you've taken shots for twenty odd years, there's still something you won't be that happy about. It's like, oh, yeah. ooh, just. But that's the thing that keeps us on edge: the constancy of learning, the constancy of challenging. It's not right. I've I've done that. I don't need to photograph that anymore. It's like, well, uh, it's it's not like that you've you've got to you've got to constantly keep at it you've got to constantly understand or research and you know, i spend a lot of time on youtube i've you know i've got a couple of great guys uh, that i follow i'm sure you've got people you'll watch and they always even though you know a technique is always something extra that you can pick out and think actually 
that could work or I'll try that next time or I'll give that a go. Even yeah, if yeah. the majority of it you've already know, it's just that little bit that just ups the game a bit or just tweaks and changes things. Um, right, we'll go on to another shot, which is, I think, the final shot of this deck. Now, this is... It's quite a powerful shot. Um, it's clearly monochromatic um, with a, a huge... A huge fill, but coming from the back, a huge key light coming from the back, not from the front, with a subtle fill at the, at the uh, uh, you know, to his, to his his left. So, where was this? What was this one for? Is this the? Um, is it like a big guy with tattoos? Yeah, yeah, he's a unit, all right, and he's he's tattooed. Yeah, uh, he's. Uh, he's I, I do a lot for sales sharks, and this is Sammy Tutupa. He's. Uh, He's like, you know, he's an ex all black, you know, he's like as good as it gets. And he's, he is an absolute unit. This was every couple of years we do a sharks and cover shoot. So basically the lads get the kids off all the proceeds. They did a calendar, went to charity, you know, lots of children's charities. Um, and he actually, I think he turned up on the day of the shoot. He wasn't sort of scheduled to, you know, it was done at the uh, training center in Carrington. And he wasn't scheduled to come along, but he just went, oh, then, you know, got his kit off and and he's just got this presence. You know, he's got these Maori tattoos, but he's he looks so menacing. He's, you know, he's like, when he looks at you like that, and they call him, I think they call him like Hacksaw Sam, you know, so when he tackles you, you don't get up in a hurry. But <laughs> but he's he's the nicest guy. He's the nicest, m most friendly guy, you know, and this... I've encountered with, with lots of sportsmen, but rugby players are great. I mean, I've photographed a few footballers. They're quite tough because they've been turned into celebrities and they, you know, they sort of have this entourage. They get used to that. But rugby players, these guys are like international global figures. You know, I shot with Fafta Clerk and a few others down at the Sharks a while ago, and they're That's just a shame regular. <laughs> well, yeah. Although I recently found out my grandfather's born in Joburg, so I, I do lay claim to uh, being part of South Africa and winning the World Cup. Okay, and that's the uh, end of the uh, broadcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but they, they're, they're, they're great guys. Love working with them, and they're professional as well. You know, normally you're given, uh, if you're doing a shoot, you, you're given a slot. And with some some people, models are great. They do the hour or, or day you put them for, but with sports people... Often they've got different agendas and they don't hang around, but rugby players have been, always been brilliant, always been brilliant. And so Sammy, yeah, I mean, he looks like he's about to, you know, put my camera through my face, but actually he's just giving me that standard mean and moody look that they all do when, when he points a camera at them. <laughs> well, it worked on the shots there. Yeah, it's, it's really good. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, we've got some questions and we have we've uh, have, we answered Sebastian's one but he's also um he's also right, so I'm going to stick these up in the broadcast so the first one is from JJ uh and JJ asks uh, in lockdown would it be how would I best take photos of my kids on my phone now i think you've got something to say about that yeah funny you should ask that JJ there's a really good youtube tutorial uh yeah well you know we got uh wild child and that does kids photography and i thought why not while we're all sat at home with our kids and we'd all become online and virtual you know we all had a pop at the joe wicks workout that didn't work out too well for us but um <laughs> i thought why not do a little youtube video and did that not sure i'm gonna have another dabble at becoming a youtuber it was Probably not my most successful moment, and uh, but you know, a bit of fun, a bit of fun. Yeah, it's good. Well, the fact that it's there, we're, and what we'll do is, in at the end of this, I will add the link into the uh, into the bottom of the feed, so you can so people can actually go and have a look at it. Um, we have another one uh, from Sebastian again. Um, if you could shoot anywhere in the world, where would it be? <clears throat> I've got a couple of places I really want to go to. I mean, it sort of combines the mountaineering with the photography, but Himalayas is a big one on my list. Um, and it may be that Sebastian 
because he's the guy who I first went to the Atlas Mountains with. So it could be that he's out there with me. But I don't I don't want to do Everest. I'm not massively keen on doing the base camp or um <clears throat> but I'd like to go somewhere more remote and have an adventure. Go for a couple of weeks, maybe go out of Nepal and you know get a local guide and just go and do a few mountains and just live it and breathe it and document it. You know, I, I love the sort of photo essay approach, which I did in the Pyrenees when you go somewhere and just shoot portraits or moments or tastes or details or landscapes. Um, so yeah, probably Himalayas is probably one of those big ones on my, on my bucket list at the moment. Excellent. Well, it's well worth, uh, there you go. Hope that, hope that helps Sebastian. Um, now Hugo asked a question, uh, where was your favorite place in the UK to take photos? Mm, it's got to be the Lake District. As I'm looking at you on the, you know, my screensaver behind you is the shot of Tabs at Buttermere. Um, I love it. I just love it there. It's every corner. It's so Scotland's stunning. It's epic and it's wild and it's like it's our last wilderness. But the lakes is a, a, an image every t- corner you turn. You know, you turn, you go for a walk, and there's this beautiful pub with a you know, with this amazing background, it's just, it's so tight and winding with all those weathered, rained, moss-covered walls and doors, you know, it's just, I, I love it, it's, it's a sort of, it's a real blend of man and nature in this little natural, natural sort of arc, yeah, the Lake Street is probably my, my favourite place in the UK. Lovely, you go, I hope that answers your question. Um, Another question from Paul Langley. Uh, Paul asks, do you think compacts, compact cameras, are now a thing of the past? Now we have uh, phones with having such a thing as three lenses, Leica lens, and everything packed down into a smartphone. Yeah, I guess they are. I guess, you know, um, I think there'll always be a need for professional cameras, and I think those are getting closer and closer. I sort of... I looked at maybe getting, you know, medium format cameras, but I'm, I think the 35 mil DSLR equivalent to getting better and better. And I think, like you say, the phones are getting so good now. I don't see why I have a compact camera when your phone's in your pocket. It's slimline and it's, it does, does so much. I mean, the quality of them is just amazing. Yeah. I think that's, that goes back to what I was talking about before where there were, um, uh, where media itself, press and media, a lot of it's moved off. I mean, you can see people recording with the, you know, on the on the on the the bottom of the, well, the microphones on on most smartphones these days are, are absolutely excellent. Mm-hmm. So you'll find, you know, you see it on press conferences, um, you know, and and they've just got a phone there, and a, a lot of quick shots are taken on phones. I think I think it is replacing it completely, um, but. I'll be honest, I think that just to counter that point, that Panasonic, I think, used to do, I don't know they still do, an absolute killer um, compact camera. In fact, Sony do a, a lovely range of compact cameras, um, and Canon as well. I think all the manufacturers do them. Um, I, would never, I mean, I used to be a Pentax guy. I know Pentax do a few, and Olympus do a few. But these mm. these super compact, uh, you know, these Panasonic cameras and and the other guys, I think I th- actually still think they have a place. I think what we're trying to do is replicate DSLR technology, and of course, in those in those cameras, it's really hard because it's it's, it's a very small sensor, um, as whereas you know, using a phone, you have got three lenses and the software interpolation. So we're constantly looking for it. But I'll always the, the difference is though that. That this is, I think this is an eight-bit device. Now the difference we get, and we—that's why you and I can detect the difference. We can see a smartphone shot sometimes. We can spot it depending on how it's been shot, uh, because we can. Our eyes are trained to see uh, 12-bit, 16-bit raw files, which is a lot of colorimetric uh, and light data straight inside a shot. So for us, we know when something's like that. But I think the mass market 
It's not about that. It's actually about yeah. the capture. It's the content. Let's get the shot. So I don't know. I think it's 50-50. I think some, there's still a market for it, but I don't know where it is. Yeah. I think some people still use them, but I, they're all they're all super evolving, aren't they? You know, I, I need to – I just never had the cash to buy a bridge camera kit, but I want to get something like, you know, one of those Fujis where – I've got two or three lenses, much more compact, and it does a DSLR job because that's the frustration I've always got. When I go out there with whatever camera I've got, I wish I had the best lens possible. I wish I had, you know, I can see a shot, you know, that needs a 400 mil or that needs a 35 mil prime or, you know, mm. whatever you've got, you've never got all the kit that you need, but it's just the way it is. But I, I think it's interesting to see how quickly phones are evolving because they really are just you know they're doing an incredible job yeah i think i think the latest i think it's the iphone 11 pro the the wide angle lens actually when i can't when i seeing when i'm seeing things posted on social it's quite it's quite a thing that it really is now i don't know whether it actually films at that uh, at that wide angle if it does then you know that's that's a beast um but it's i mean i do a lot i like a lot of wide narrative shots so i like tight tight storytelling shots but i do like wide uh, you know, wide shots that that that, that tell a broader story that'll have you looking at the shot for ages, like looking at all the details of it. Um, oh, it's interesting. So, I think we're coming towards the to the to the to the end of where we are. I'm afraid. Um, uh, Sebastian is telling us that he's booking the flights now uh, to go to the Himalayas. <laughs> Good lad. So, Mark, it's been really interesting. Um, I've learned a bit more there, and I've known you for ages. Um, and I think that's, I think there may be people there. Um, oh, actually, no, 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 another question. Another question from Paul Langley. Who are your photography heroes? Now, I don't really have any because uh, I'm just a. You don't have any? No, very few. Well, Cartier Bresson, mainly because he was, he's a documentary photographer. He's probably the principal documentary photographer. Um, and and I pr I probably say for landscapes I don't like landscapes but Ansel's work is is outstanding mm. and it's mainly outstanding because of the technology he had at the time to capture what okay. is the world's most recognisable landscape photography obviously Yosemite so but it is it they're, they're unbelievable I think those yeah I still can't get into <laughs> landscape photography even though I think that's amazing. Um, but that's that's those are those are really my two. I'm just Sammy Davis Jr. Actually, was a fantastic photographer. People don't know that. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant photographer. And he'd, he'd, have, he'd have got access to people and moments that no one else could. So straight away, he's got killer shots. Oh, I mean, there's there's a load out there. There is a load out there. He's taken but shots of Sinatra. It's like how the shots of. Um, in fact, the Rat Pack came to Manchester. And there is a stack of shots that he took in Manchester of the Rat Pack, you know, on the streets, smoking away, doing stuff. I, can, I mean, that, that, that's, I think that's probably one of the things that connected me. It's my home city. And also mm. the fact that, I, you know, I, I'm, I, liked, I like the music, I like the genre. And these guys were, were, were rogues. Plus, this guy is, just happens to be a killer photographer. It's, it's pretty good. Mm. How about you? What's, what's yours? Um, probably got three, I reckon. Uh, one of my favorites is Don McCullin. Love his stuff, you know, war photojournalist. I mean, if you've read his autobiography, how the guy is still alive is just amazing. It's just, and you know, that was, I think, an area that I considered going into when I first got into photography. Probably. Fairly glad that I didn't, but uh, Richard Avedon, loved him. Again, beautiful, monochromatic, uh, pioneering fashion photographer. And also the way he, <clears throat> this was all pre-retouching, he'd, do, he'd, he'd get his printers in the darkroom to mix images, which I experimented with when I was at art college doing my photography course, um, some of the techniques he used. But... Probably the biggest name for me is Sebastio Salgado. I mean, I just, Brazilian, <clears throat> he was an economist who got into um, journalism, photojournalism, and he did a project. Have you heard of Salgado? Uh, 
I've heard of I've heard of the name. I don't. I I'd probably know his work rather than I will know him, which is um, my problem. I'm I'm terrible yeah. at, at 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 chasing stuff down. I'm pretty bad. Go on, go for it. Have a look at his stuff. He did this project called Workers, and he went round the globe. I don't know who. It must have been a newspaper or someone who you know who backed him and you know sent him off to do this shoot. But all shot on film, thirty five mil. And I saw an exhibition when I was at college, and it was all printed on platinum prints, which is a technique that probably doesn't exist anymore. And these prints had this almost three-dimensional quality, beautiful images. But the subject matter, it could be, you know, gold miners in Africa or sugarcane workers in Brazil. And it was a time of the Channel Tunnel, you know, between England and France. So we did all these projects that were just... Um, just incredible. If you get a chance, if any any of you get a chance, have a look at Sebastião Salgado's works. He's uh, yeah, he's probably the biggest influence that I I um, that I can I can think of for me. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna make an attempt here at uh, probably screwing the broadcast up a little bit, but I may I'm just gonna attempt to go and show the work. Right, so you can't see it, but it is it is as described, which is a quite a challenging environment for any human being uh some are not even wearing shoes some are wearing shoes that tied on it's dirty it's muddy they look like gold miners um and it is quite it's it's quite a heavy it's quite a heavy image but the the quality of it mm. right okay so i really need to sort of get my uh get myself together and, and refocus on some some proper photographers rather than me isolating myself so that's a lesson learned right there <laughs> so uh, thanks paul for stimulating my own embarrassment but it's fine it's 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 probably a long time coming <laughs> right there are no more comments i'm afraid mark but i think we've had a few there and we have been on for over an hour uh, right. which is which is good uh, it will be available on youtube and i'll repost it again on uh, facebook so people can have a watch and and, and past comments, and I sincerely hope everyone enjoyed it. So, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Cheers, buddy.